It's the big show, talking to my favourite people and the world's biggest stars, and they come no bigger than Joe Brand. How are you? Um, thank you. It's Ed really, good. it's really nice to talk That's to you again. That's a complete lie, or do you mean size-wise? No, no, no. Don't be silly. Of course you are. You're one of my favourite people. You know this. We've met in the past. I'm sure you can't remember, but um, we've always got on very well, and I always find you very funny. It amazes me when I look on certain message boards and in this book that you've just released that not everybody likes Joe Brand. What's wrong with them? Oh, I don't know. Are they are they ill in some way, possibly? <laughs> I've just been on holiday for two weeks in Greece and I always take my laptop with DVDs and what I'd been sent uh, was the Mrs Merton DVD and there you were on the first one. How is it you look better now 15 years later? Yeah, I don't know. By the time I'm 90, I'm going to be gorgeous. <laughs> Do you enjoy doing these type of interviews? Because, I mean, obviously that's deliberately uncomfortable, isn't it? Something like Mrs Merton. Would you rather be in character as Joe Brand on stage than having to talk to me sensibly like we're going to do for the next three hours? I think it depends. Because I think that one thing that people never take into account is what someone's mood is like when they're doing something, you know. And there are times when... I've done TV or I've done radio and for various reasons I was feeling absolutely terrible. So I'm kind of just going through the motions and there are other days when I'm in a really good mood and I feel happy and I'm looking forward to the future and they're fun. Um, and so it, it kind of really depends on how you're feeling. I think you go on to automatic pilot sometimes, but I'm not doing that today. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, this could end in disaster. Is this a good day or a bad one? Pretty good so far. <laughs> You've got this new book out and it basically starts at the beginning of your professional career. I'm trying to get from it whether you loved doing comedy in these clubs because they were damn hard work, weren't they? Well, they were hard work, but I, d I did love it. And um, what I liked about it was um, working with a group of other comics and sort of particularly in some of the harder gigs developing a kind of siege mentality <laughs> directed at the audience <laughs> and sort of supporting each other but also you know there's nothing better as a stand-up than actually having great nights where you get really big laughs and encores and all that and you know that didn't obviously happen every night at the beginning in fact it hardly happened at all for a bit really but once I started to kind of learn some little tricks and be a bit more confident it was fantastic yeah I loved it what kind of person were you at that time in your life? Because you've got to be incredibly cocky to think you can walk on a stage and suddenly have people enthralled with your humour. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I've ever been a cocky person. But I think what I was was... I, I've always been competitive with men. I can't help it. I think it's my brother's fault because I'm the middle child and I have an older and a younger brother who used to give me hell as a kid. And I think I kind of developed a, a very sort of competitive um you know a competitive approach really through them having kind of hit me with cricket bats and made me support west ham and stuff like that and um so you know it was it was kind of a challenge to me really to to see whether i could sort of be up there with the big boys as it were when I look at the picture of you now, obviously you're far more glamorous and you've obviously lost a lot of weight since the days Am when I? you were on the stage. Oh, of course, look Am at those pages. I mean, you've even had your hair done on the front of it. It's marvellous. I tell you what it made me wonder was whether it was all just a cover. Um, were you crying in the inside about how you came across? Because, of course, a lot of your comedy is about your physicality, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the reason it was about that is well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, having kind of been fat from about the age of 15, 16... Um, you know, I garnered a lot of like very negative comments on the street, as a lot of women do who aren't attractive for whatever reason it may be. And so, you know, they're very hurtful because um, even though you are literally thick skinned, uh, you're not thick skinned emotionally and unless you've got a personality disorder, which I hope I haven't. Um, so, you know, there was that kind of history of having had people have a go at me. And I know it wasn't just me because I've kind of talked to friends who've had abuse on the street from uh, blokes and we all get it from time to time. Um, and also I knew I wasn't naive enough to think as a stand up who's a woman and who was fat that I could go on stage and they would just ignore that. So I knew I was going to get it in the neck for for that on stage. So in a way, I just had to be prepared for it. Graham Norton calls me the ugliest man on the radio and he's right to do so. I've struggled with my weight my entire life. Why were you so big? Was it covering up something or did you just like eating? 
Well, it was a combination of things. I mean, I do like eating, and uh, I'm sure there's a there's a portion control issue <laughs> in my life. <laughs> uh, but not only was it uh, was it that I, when I was 16, I went on the pill, and for some reason, I've no idea why. And six months, I put on three stone, and I wasn't kind of eating more. I was just eating the same. So it was the pill's fault to some extent. And then I thought, well, if I stop taking the pill, it'll all miraculously melt away. And of course, it never did. It's a good comic ruse, though, isn't it, to go on stage and have something to talk about before you even get into your material. Did, did it work to your advantage? I mean, it immediately made people warm to you because you kind of knocked them down before they knocked you. Yeah, that was that was what I tried to do. Um Putting on loads of weight wasn't a comic ruse, can I just tell you? It was just what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, then you went and lost it all again, and now you're delicious, if you don't mind me saying so. I do mind you saying. Well, um, no, I do, I'm only joking. I don't mind you saying it at all. I haven't lost it all. What are you on about? Well, honestly, I mean, when I look at you now on the TV and I look at, back at those Mrs. Merton days and, and even have the pictures got, in the have book. Have you got a picture of someone different? No, honestly, Joe. Look, I'm looking at your book. I've got it here in front of me. When I look at page. Uh, oh, that's 115. All, that's all. I mean, you were literally 115 stone. I was 114 stone, I'll have you know. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> was there a point, though, when you wanted to glam up? But that's basically what I'm asking. Oh, for heaven's sake. No, there wasn't. Oh, right. No, so it just happened by accident. Well, no. I think the thing is that actually, you know, women lie along a continuum, and a lot of women couldn't give a toss about what they look like and up the other end of the continuum women are obsessed with how they look now i'm somewhere quite near the other that couldn't give a toss end really i'm not that bothered <laughs> about it and you know but that's not to say if um i'm going out i won't sort of put a bit of makeup on because you can still try yeah make the best of a bad job like myself indeedy let me play a piece of music and we'll come back with joe brand one of my favorite people a new books out now it's called can't stand up for sitting down we're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to Jo Brand today about her life and career. Can I talk about your private life and men? Because that's something that you talk about in the book. Getting one and marrying one and then making kids. Did you find it easy to pull? Yeah. <laughs> Is that good enough for you? <laughs> so did they fall in love with the act or did they fall in love with you? I'm talking before your husband, of course, loves you for who you are. I would say that uh, before I did comedy, I didn't have any problem. And after I did comedy, I didn't have any problem either. Um, I think, you know, um, I don't know. What do I think? I think if you're not traditionally attractive, you um, tend to gravitate towards a certain sort of man and they gravitate towards you. And I quite like a man who's not putting a woman's looks first on his list of pulling requirement shall we say hmm. so you get to the point when you find the man and how did you know that you'd got the right one because we all go through life searching don't we do we are you still searching oh i am love are you well there's been a oh. moment with jay mcdonald and sue Pala, but it's not worked out <laughs> do they come as a pair <laughs> they do, <don't> um <laughs> I, I don't know how you know. I couldn't possibly put it into words, but I just did. How does he feel about you being Joe Brown the act? Because when I look at what you do now, if you don't mind me saying you're more cuddly and warm um, than you were in the beginning. I mean, your act was quite hard, wasn't it? I remember seeing you 10 or 15 years ago and, and you, you did have more of an edge, didn't you? Um, so people say, I don't know, really. Uh, maybe I, I, I can't t I can't really assess my own impact, to be honest with you. So if you're saying that, I believe you. <laughs> Were you prepared to be on the road forever? Because, I mean, when I read about these clubs, they look miserable. It's not glamorous backstage. You do your 20 minutes, you might get booed off, you might be loved. It's not really very fun, is it, being on the road as a stand-up comedian? I tour with a guy called Andy Robinson, who I'm really fond of, and we, we really enjoy ourselves. We have a laugh, we listen to nice music in the car, we read the papers, we discuss the news. I liked working on a bill with other people. You know, there was less pressure on you to be something. And, um, yeah, I'm quite happy to do my 20 minutes and get off and get my little brown envelope with my 50 quid in. <laughs> Can I ask you about that loneliest place in the world when you do your big punchline and no one laughs? I'm sure it doesn't happen very often these days, but back in the old days when you were learning how to do what you do now so brilliantly, how do you get out of that and, and how does that feel? Well, it kind of feels like your innards have been ripped out with a big fork and um, 
how do you get over it? I think you have to act as if you don't care because if if um, an audience kind of gets a whiff of you deflating slightly after something hasn't worked, their kind of losing of confidence in you kind of just runs away and they just kind of give up on you and they don't laugh at all at anything. So I think you have to just pretend that you didn't care that they didn't laugh and move on to the next one. And even now, I mean, you get asked to do things like If I Got News For You, which you're brilliant at, and QI, which I love you on. Um, does anything intimidate you now? Are there moments of nervousness or do you just get over it and get on and do it? No, well, I get nervous about all those things because, I mean, with Have I Got News and QI, I've had good ones and bad ones. I've had some shockers on QI when I just was either tired or a bit irritable or my hamster had been eaten by a local pensioner, where, where I just had bad days, you know, and, and you feel terrible afterwards because you think, I haven't been as good as I could have been. But that's how life is for everyone. You have good days, you have bad days, and you just have to live with it. Mm. And dare I mention the two words Britney and Spears to you? You, you dare. Well, you've done various things for charity, and who should mock when you're raising money for a good cause? But um, that was a, a curious combination, Joe Brand and Britney Spears. I thought it was rather good. <laughs> well, I like your legs. Uh, uh, north did of you? north of that, Ooh, I don't you're know so, so much. Sexist. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a problem with that still? How do you think the world of comedy is now? Because I know that I, I don't want to go over old ground, but I mean, they say there aren't enough female comics. I mean, there's Victoria Wood, which is uh, you know brilliant, and there's you out there banging the drum for comedy. Um, why aren't there more female comics? Um, I think because they all feel they've got to stay in and do the ironing. No, uh, what do I think? I think that it's it's a self-confidence issue still, that a lot of women don't feel they deserve to hold their ground in the joke-telling um, scenario. Mm. Do you think it's just they can't be bothered to put up with a nonsense of comedy? Because, I mean, it's, it is a silly game. You come and go. There are very few like you who last the course, aren't there? Well, it may well be that. I think a lot of women that I've known on the circuit who gave up just kind of got ground down and got bored with it and got fed up with slogging around the country. And particularly, I think, if you have kids, it's a very different prospect for a woman um, compared to a man. It's just easier for a man to travel and be away from home. So that really, there's lots of reasons. And then Trini and Susanna, that was a big part of your life as well, that a lot of people, I think it was probably the first time we got to see the real you, um, and you kind of your boundaries were down, weren't they, in a, in a way, because we got to see, well, most of you. Do you think they did that to take the mickey out of you, or they genuinely were trying to help? <laughs> no, I, I think neither, to be honest. I think they, they certainly genuinely weren't trying to help. Um, were they taking the mickey out of me? Mm, I don't know, maybe a bit. But I think actually, ultimately, what they were trying to do was make an entertaining piece of television, however they needed to do that. Do you have any regrets almost showing your knockers on TV to the entire world? Well, I didn't show my knockers. They did ask me, believe you me. But uh, I, Yeah, of course they did. But uh, mm, I wonder what I said to that. I would pay good money no, to see that. thank you, matron. <laughs> I'm going to take a final piece of music, then we'll be back with our remaining moments with Joe Brand. Because uh, I don't feel like I am. I did go to Brunel University. I wasn't in Cambridge Footlights. I've never been anywhere near an esteemed institution of learning, so that's why. But you have proved me to be a moron twice already in this 20 minutes. I think you've managed that all on your own, actually. <laughs> Uh, where do you go from here? Because now you've got the perfect life, really, where people invite you to do stuff, and it seems to get more and more bizarre, whether it be music or taking your clothes off for Trini and Suzanne. Are you happy living this life Trini now? Because you've got not Susanna, not Suzanne. Oh, is it really? I couldn't kill us. I don't watch that program, to be honest with you. It's, it's I'm for sorry. Ladies. I'm just looking for things now. Are you? I'm sorry. I'm well, winding you up. I, I know. This is this is suddenly becoming hard work for me. I'm now becoming slightly paranoid. Oh, don't be. No, it's not. It's not nice. Um, so, what can I ask you next then? That I couldn't. It wouldn't be a cock up because I don't want to offend you any further. You see, you won't. Don't worry. You can ask me anything you like. <laughs> so, in terms of your future, where do you go then? Are you happy living this life where they kind of throw anything at you and you get to do it? Because I mean, music's been a big part of your life lately, hasn't it? Playing the organ. Do yes. you mean? Yes. Yes. I was trying to lead well, you into something there in a very subtle right, okay. way. You see. 
Sorry. Not so just... subtle, I didn't even notice. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I love music. And I do, what I tend to do, I don't have a five-year plan. And so if someone asks me to do something, I think, do I like that and do I want to do it? And if the answer is yes twice, then I will do it, you know. And in terms of your daughters now, you've got two daughters. I mean, you, you, you talk about that in the book because they've been a big part of your career, really, juggling the two. How do they feel about mum being the lady off the telly? Well, um, to be honest, they're sort of surprisingly pragmatic about it, which I like, you know, um, because they've always lived with it. That, and, and as you know, they've always known that that's what I did. Um, so they, they kind of couldn't be bothered <laughs> either way, really. <laughs> do they actively go out and search for what you're doing or do they try and avoid you when you're on the telly? Oh, well, I don't let them watch me on the telly because they're too young, really. Mm. Give, give them a few more years till they're 25, then they can have a look. Do you suddenly have to have a moral compass about what you say yes to and no to? Because, they, I mean, they are going to find out, aren't they, if you're on the front of a paper? Yeah, what do you mean, like, in terms of having an affair with someone? Now, or, there's an um, idea. Have you thought of doing that? That'd be good for ratings, wouldn't it? <laughs> would it? Well, for, in okay, terms of my right. programme, if you'd be willing to admit that, that would be marvellous. I'll have a think and uh, call someone. <laughs> How much do you have to worry about family life compared to show business? Because in the old days, I mean, when the book started, you could do anything and get away with anything, stay out till three in the morning. Now you've got a family to feed, haven't you? Well, the fact of the matter is I don't want to do anything that would get me on the front pages. So I, it's not really an issue. And I think in terms of <clears throat> a moral compass, my moral compass has always been the same and always will be. I haven't had to sort of reset it because I've got children. I just, you know, think it's highly unlikely, if not impossible, that I'm going to do anything that would upset them. And looking again at the research, I notice you like football quite a lot, don't you? Who'd have thought I it? I do like football. Who'd have thought it? Who'd mm-hmm. have thunk it? And do you go down regularly? Do you have a puck of pie during the interval? Do I have a what? A puck of pie. Oh, no, I always go in the posh bit. Oh, do you? Uh, they have smoked <laughs> salmon in there. Champagne these days, is it? Yes, that's right. It's beautiful. Uh, and do you do any exercise? I mean, do you do sport? Because I'm looking at you on here. I mean, there's something happened. I'm telling you, you can deny it, but there's something happened. You've had a makeover. You look glam and delicious and slimmer. Oh, shut up. What are you doing? Take like? a compliment. That's the thing with you, Joe. You never take a compliment. Are you looking compliment. at a picture of Judith Chalmers by mistake? No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> i tell you what, one, one thing I am looking at is a picture here on, I don't know what page it is, but there's you in bed uh, with somebody very famous. I mean, oh, Jarvis Cocker. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, that's, that's quite a corking picture, isn't it, really? <laughs> that, was a, that was a bad paparazzi moment, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> You've got to be careful where they stick the lens these days, haven't you? Absolutely. I do swimming. Do you? I said, do. Mm-hmm. What, what happens when people in the dressing... I've always wondered about famous people when you have to get changed in front of the general public. Do you worry about what they're going to say to you whilst you're in the shower? Do you know what? I go in a cubicle, would you believe? <laughs> it's really lovely talking to you, and this book is, is a thrill. I'll tell you why it's a thrill more than anything. You just hear your voice uh, through the whole thing and your sarcasm and your wit and your humour. You write right at the back that um, yeah, th- there's not much slagging off of celebrities. I mean, you are really quite nice to people in here. There, there isn't any of that uh, airing of dirty laundry, is there? There must be some people who you hate in show business. Yeah, there, there's loads. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not prepared to tell you who they are or why, because no. I don't think that's what that's what it's all about. Good for you. Thank you so much for uh, this lovely book. It's called uh, What Joe Did Next. Joe Brands, number one best-selling author, of course. It's tremendous. Some nice things written on the back as well. Have you seen these from the Daily Express? Uh, I think my dad made all those ones mm, up. Very nice. Larger than life, very funny, said The Telegraph, which is about the nicest thing they've ever said about anybody, isn't it, really? Yes, it probably is, actually. Joe Brand, thanks for coming on the programme. Has it been OK? I don't want to aggravate you, because I feel sometimes I get on your nerves. Oh, shut up. No, you don't. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> well, I'm very flattered. Thank you very much. I'll have a word with my husband and see what I can do. <laughs> see you later, Joe. Bye-bye. Ta-da, bye.